Well, uh, my thanks to you all for, for coming along today. Uh, very much appreciated. And uh, we always like to try and ensure at Africa Research Institute that we assemble uh, a, t a team of experts for these uh, events. And I'm uh, very gratified and pleased and grateful that that is certainly the case today. We have nursing experts, midwifery experts, uh, businessmen, uh, we have um, experts on remittances, we have development experts, and I hope that we will therefore have a, a, a very lively discussion after uh, the presentations. But my thanks again to you all for coming. Of course, the credit uh, for, for uh, such a, a great turnout is, is not ours at Africa Research Institute. It is uh, Fauzia's, and um, I'd like to express my uh, extreme gratitude to Fauzia Ishmael, Executive Director of the Somaliland Nursing and Midwifery Association, for coming all the way to be with us today. Uh, it's been my very great privilege to work with Fauzia on this publication since... February uh, of this year uh, with Fazia and her colleagues, I must add. There's always been a very considerable interest in this country in health in Somaliland. Uh, the first reference in the British Medical Journal to health issues in Somaliland was in February 1907, can you believe? And the first reference in the Lancet to uh, the health situation in Somaliland was in 1905. So, Fauzia, you're following in a long line of, uh, uh, of interest. I would also uh, like to welcome today uh, Michael Walls, who is Director of Research at the Development Planning Unit at University College London. Uh, as many of you will know, uh, he was a senior election observer in Somaliland during the presidential elections last year and has written extensively over the years about the emergence of a state government in Somaliland uh, and has been intimately associated with organisations such as Progressio, Somaliland Focus and so forth over the years. And, and Michael is going to paint a, a, a little picture about, a, a short picture about um, the political situation and the makeup of the state in Somaliland. I hope I haven't landed you in it there, Michael. I'm sure I'll uh, work with that up. I'd also, I'd also like to uh, welcome Mohamed Youssef, who is Chairman and Chief Executive of Invicta Capital here in London, who has uh, extensive uh, business interests and obviously family links as well with the country, who is going to uh, impart a, 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 a sort of diaspora view to us today. So thank you both very much indeed for coming. Uh, a short word for those of you who are not familiar with Africa Research Institute. Uh, we're a strictly independent, non-partisan think tank. Uh, we're established in uh, 2007 and are funded by a single benefactor, Richard Smith, um, who, to whom we are very grateful for making all of this possible. This, this publication and Fauzia's ap appearance today uh, and Richard, I hope, may be joining us a bit later. Our real raison d'etre is to draw attention to ideas and initiatives with a record of success in Africa and to draw attention to areas where perhaps new ideas are needed. Uh, I'm in no doubt in my mind that uh, the successes uh, and achievements of the Somaliland Nursing and Midwifery Association are very much our, our home territory. These are uh, what has been achieved. It, it should really be known about uh, on a far wider plane. And it, is, uh, it has been a great pleasure to, 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 to work on, on this publication. Uh, a little a short word about the format. Um, Michael will start um, uh, uh, speaking for about five minutes, and then Mohammed for about five minutes, and then Fauzia will give her presentation. And then we'll have, I hope, half an hour of discussion. And after that, uh, I'll call a sort of first closing. And if anyone has to go to, we quite understand, please do just, uh, just slip away. Um, I'm sorry I've not managed to meet all of you in, in person in the half an hour before, but do please keep in touch and do please circulate this publication. Take as many away with you uh, as you want for people who you know will be interested.
Um, anybody who is able to stay longer is, is more than welcome to stay, and Fazir has very kindly agreed to continue uh, discussing uh, um, all aspects of her work um, for uh, as long as she has the strength and you have the questions. So on that note, um, Michael, uh, it would be very kind if you could, if you could start. Thank you, Edward. Um, hopefully I'll be able to paint some kind of picture. Um, let's see what it looks like at the end. I, in working out what I was going to say now, I was trying to think of the kinds of connections that I could draw between health and politics, because certainly I'm not um, an expert on the health system or health in general. Um, there are some, some parallels, and I'll try not to labour them too much, but I'll try and draw some attention to them. One of those parallels is the way that a lot of what is happening and has happened in the years since 1991 in Somaliland have been self-directed, directed by Somalilanders. Now, I want to just make a point that by self-directed, I do mean self-directed. I hear from time to time the, the line that Somaliland is all about Somaliland having done it themselves and that if only outsiders, externals, external agents would get out of um, Somali culture, everything would be okay. That came up, that's come up in Somali, Somaliland, um, talking to Somalis from different bits of the Somali areas. It also came up recently in the Daily Mail. It's been brought up in the, by The Economist. Now, you can imagine the agendas there are a little bit different. Um, but I don't mean that. I don't mean that Somaliland, if only they were left alone, would just get on with it and do everything themselves. Somali culture is based and has long been based on trade and connections with outside world. So I'm not talking about some kind of isolationist um, process. But the fact is that a lot of what has happened politically and I think in the health sector in Somaliland has been directed, driven by, by local people. And that has been part of the, the reason for real successes, really quite remarkable successes. But as with health, there are many challenges in politics, or I could say the other way around. As with politics, there are many challenges in health. Um, the first point is that both sectors, I think, have achieved what they've achieved because of wide public support for, in the case of politics, peace, and in the case of health, I think, for just something to be done. It's that public support has enabled, in the political sphere, a series of conferences and meetings since 1991, and since, in fact, since 1990. The big ones were in Borao, followed by a period of conflict and a number of smaller pe meetings, and then in 1993 again in Borama, um, then again a period of conflict, and in 1997 a Hargeza conference, which still a lot of people deride as being politically driven, but it had the um, remarkable, made, marked the remarkable achievement of adopting a, a constitution which has remained, not in the same form, but some form uh, distinguishably similar to what was adopted in 1997, and it solved some of the, the issues of endemic conflict in the country. Um, not that there haven't been re-emergences of small-scale conflict um, periodically, but there hasn't been a reoccurrence of that widespread conflict that happened before that conference and before the Bottomer conference, conference and in the Civil War. The process has not been smooth. That's clear from the fact that each of these periods of, of reconciliation were um, interspersed with periods of conflict. Fundamental to that, though, is this commitment and what I think has been a growing public commitment to, to maintain a process of um, discussion and dialogue and to maintain overall a state of peace in Somaliland. Some, the, the same process has happened in recent years. We've seen remarkable, notable elections for uh, local bodies, twice for, for president, for the parliament, for the lower house of parliament. Each of those elections has been preced, preceded by its own political crises. Those crises have been resolved to the point where the elections themselves could take place with a high degree of credibility. I was there in the run-up to the 2005 parliamentary election when I was helping to organise international observers. I was then a co coordinator of the international observation in 2010. So I know some of those problems fairly intimately. 
in 2005, there was a big argument about whether or not to register voters. The decision was made that one more election could be run without a voter register. In 2010, the problem was that they decided to register voters, and that was the big, the big problem, the big dispute. In fact, in September 2009, there was one of the notable interventions from outside agents which enabled things to move forward. It broke a, a barrier in the road. And that was the agreement that was brokered by the Ethiopians with a, with, with a lot of influence from the UK government, um, suggesting a six-point memorandum that might just enable the political parties to come to find some way of progr progressing with preparation for the election. A memorandum was signed on the 30th of September 2009, and that was what laid the ground for the political parties to come together and be able to agree that an election could be held using a voter register, which it was had become extremely politicised and was very problematic. The most recent announcement is that local elections will take place in April 2012, this time without a voter register. So we're back in the same, with the same problem of, of counting people. Now, there's a connection there. I said I wasn't going to labour the connections too much, but actually counting people is a political process, and it's a very political process in Somaliland, because counting people means agreeing... Who, which regions have the most and which regions have smaller populations than they thought that they had. And I see in, uh, that headcount is the title of one of the chapters in, in this report. As I said, I won't labour the, the parallel too much, but actually knowing how many people are in the health sector or in a region or district um, has significant implications for what can be done in that area. Um, I think that there is every chance that the local authority elections will happen successfully. I think there's very little chance, this is a personal opinion, that they will happen in April, but I'm sure that they will happen sometime soon after that. It would be nice if they happened in April, but I suspect that there are significant challenges to, to, to get um, things in place for that to happen. One of those significant challenges is opening up the political realm to the registration of new political parties, given what you may or may not know of as the constitutional limit on parties to three. That's uh, another political and highly charged debate. So there's a lot, of, a lot of energy, a lot of discussion at the moment behind the process of launching new parties. There are a lot of new parties, or as they're more accurately called, political associations, being launched, having just been launched or about to be launched in Somaliland at the moment. And they'll all be looking to register themselves and to contest the election, the local election, when it comes. I'm going to stop there because I'm pretty sure I've reached the end of my five minutes, probably over. Um, but just to say that that, that at the moment is, um, I hope, paints some picture of a process which has been notable for remarkable achievements <coughs> and remarkable ability to address challenges. But that's not to diminish, to diminish the scale of the challenges. And I think probably that's the parallel to draw with health sector um, development and the report that we'll be talking about now. Thank you, Michael, very much. No. Okay. Um, thank you very much. <coughs> First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Edward, Edward Pace, uh, for not only uh, inviting me to this, uh, to this event, but also for organizing the publication of this very important uh, paper. Um, the, the journey that led to this, this, this conclusion started... Um, a few months back when Keith Govan and I decided to hijack um, Edward to Somaliland in order to um, expose him to what we thought was a very uh, interesting um, phenomenon. Somaliland is, um, has been said to be, and, and I think he is Africa's best kept secret, and so w w anything that that uh, manages to publicize or to highlight not only the achievements of, of Somalia, Somaliland and Somalilanders over the last 20 years, but also, as in the case of this publication, to highlight the challenges um, that exist is, is certainly a commendable thing. I'd like to also thank Fauzia for um, preparing this paper, for the work that she's done, uh, the work that she's going to do, uh, and for the opportunity that this publication has to show us what, what, what needs to be done, done in the future. <laughs> Fazi is also um, very important uh, because she's a member of this strange band of people called the Somaliland Diaspora. 
And that's really what I want to talk about uh, in the five minutes allocated to me. This publication, Patients and Care, and the launch of it today is important for two reasons. Firstly, obviously healthcare is an important component of Somaliland's development, um, both historically and, and, and going forward. But it also, I'd like to argue, is a shining example of the contribution um, that the diaspora can make and has made in the past to very important areas of development, such as healthcare. And I think Fazia's involvement uh, and, and, and the work that she's doing is, is, a, is a very good um, ambassadorial example of the contribution that the uh, diaspora can make. I suppose when we talk about the Somaliland diaspora, um, the first thing to note is that we're everywhere. Um, we're not just in London, we're not just in Rome, we're not just in um, uh, New York. Um, I, I'm, as, as somebody that travels on, on business pretty much everywhere around the world, I'm often um, amazed at where you find Somalis um, in various... Uh, just the other day I got a call from somebody a Somalilander um, from Wellington, New Zealand. How did he get there? Um, just uh, on the trip that Edward and I were, were, were on to Hargeisa, uh, we took along with us uh, a, a Chinese colleague who uh, was um, surprised, although I wasn't surprised, to discover a cousin of ours who, uh, who was a student in, uh, at the university in Beijing. Uh, and it was freaky to see both of them talking in Mandarin uh, with all the gesticulations that, that, that go with it. So the first important point to realize is that the Somalis and Somalilanders in particular are everywhere. The other feature of the diaspora which I think is important from the point of view of not just development but also healthcare, which is what we're here to, to, to talk about today, is that the Somaliland diaspora is highly educated. Um, we have a thirst for knowledge which uh, never ceases to amaze me. And that was reflected just recently when I attended the meeting of some of the members of the, of the, uh, the, the cabinet. Um, and uh, I swear that there were more degrees in that room than a thermometer. I mean, the, 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 we are very, very well blessed in terms of the um, expertise that the diaspora um, can, can bring to bear. The role of the diaspora in Somaliland, I suppose, comes into three, possibly four phases. I suppose the first phase came with people like my father, who came to this country in the 30s. And it's not accidental, it's not a coincidence that the first wave of Im Somaliland immigrants, um, who were nomads, ended up mostly as uh, workers in, in, uh, in, 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 in the merchant, merchant marine. What they tended to do was a bit like the uh, Irish lump construction workers. They would work for six months, go back, build a, a water well, get married, create more children, come back, and that was the cycle. The second wave of diaspora obviously came when the um, uh, civil war broke out and a lot of people scattered uh, to, to the, the four corners of the earth. And from 1991, for a period of five or six years, I suppose, or a decade, um, the role of the diaspora was really very much focused on survival, survival of the nation, survival of their local people, their relatives. Um, the focus, obviously, was very much on remittances, making sure that there was enough money to feed the extended families um, that, that they, they felt a, a, an obligation to. The second wave, in terms of the activities of the diaspora all over the world, um, the Somaliland diaspora, was to become more actively involved, once survival became less of an issue, to become more actively involved in the rebirth of the nation. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't just enough to send money. Uh, Somalilanders abroad were actively, during this phase, involved in rebuilding uh, what was a devastated, um, a devastated nation. I think if anybody was um, involved, if any of you were involved in Somaliland um, during the, the, the 1990s, you will remember that Hargeisa was really a flattened town. It was bombed um, to, to, to a level that's it's hard to imagine now. 
And there are two examples of the contribution that the diaspora made to the, to, to the reconstruction of the nation that I think are shining examples of that. The first, of course, is the um, Edna Aden Hospital, which was uh, built on the grounds of, a, of a, a, a massacre site, a site which was used to, uh, by the Siad Bari government to execute people. And it's actually quite appropriate and very symbolic that, that, a, that a hospital that gives birth, a maternity hospital, should be uh, a, a base there. I won't dwell on Edna's story. It is remarkable. Uh, the contribution that she has made as somebody that came back willingly to, to, to do her bit is, I think, a, a fantastic example of the way in which the diaspora came back and, and, and helped in, in concrete ways. The other example is, of course, the young man who... Um, uh, uh, built the Ambassador Hotel in Hargeisa. That was a case of, of somebody who had no reason to go back. He'd made his money in, the, in, 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 in England uh, and um, he, he was considered to be a complete fool. The idea of building uh, a, 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 a hotel that Westerners would come to uh, was considered by most Somalis at the time in Hargeisa to be really rather a foolish thing to do. But rather like Conran Hilton, he said, you know, if I build it right, people will come, and they did. So that's, an, I think, another fantastic example of, of what the, the, the diaspora has done uh, and should be congratulated for. There are many other examples, and I, I, I don't intend to sort of exclude them, but those are two that come readily to mind. But there is a, a third, more mature f phase and involvement that the diaspora can, can, can get involved with uh, in terms of the next stage of Somaliland's development. And I think those are, can be subdivided into three categories. There's first the, um, the role that the diaspora can play in terms of the next stage of investment and development in, in, in Somaliland. We've come a long way. Uh, we're not going to get us where we need to be simply by waiting for aid. Aid is, aid is important, and it's an important feature of development. I'm not one of those people that, that says aid is bad. Uh, I, I believe it has a role. But I, I think it, it, the, the, the role of private enterprise, the role of investment, um, is equally if not more important, and I think that the diaspora can and is playing a vital um, position there. One of the things that, um, uh, and, and it's not just Somalilanders who are doing that, I think one of the things that I've noticed over the last five or six years is the extent to which the investment community internationally is much more willing to look at uh, Somaliland uh, for what it is rather than what they perceive. The reality and the perception of Somaliland are, are very far apart, but those, that gap is actually narrowing to, to, to a very big degree. Uh, and it's people like Mark Jones, who's sitting in the audience, who, who are doing uh, um, what they need to do to help us to, to uh, publicize the misperceptions uh, um, uh, that Somaliland has. The second area that the um, diaspora um, is playing an increasing role is in the political dimension. Uh, Michael mentioned uh, uh, some of the challenges that, that uh, uh, confront us going forward. But I suppose one of the things that I found very encouraging is the considerable number of people from uh, the Somaliland diaspora who've, who've gone back, who are making a political contribution. Uh, a large number of the people that are in the government today are people who've come from Canada, UK, US, and so on and so forth. And as I say, they're very highly educated and, and very well motivated to, to, to make a contribution. So that's an important phase which is is, is, is increasing. The third area um, is, of course, in the area of um, uh, philanthropy and charity. The, the, the diaspora uh, is increasingly becoming more prosperous uh, and, and is becoming more sophisticated in the ways in which it, it actually gives um, in a way that um, is more, more effective. Uh, and uh, I, would, uh, I would say that that's a, an ever-increasing role that the diaspora can play. I mean, for example, we, we are often tapped on the shoulder every time there's a drought. We're often tapped on the shoulder and asked to put money, and of course we do. But now, increasingly, uh, people from the diaspora are saying, wait a minute, every year I send a thousand pounds, it's the same drought. Why don't we build a well? Why don't we cure the drought? What can we do 
to actually help you to cure the problem. So I think what Somali landers are now finding is that the diaspora is becoming much more, um, much, much more uh, inquisitive as to how they can actually make a permanent difference. And I think that's, that's only to be welcomed. I'm not suggesting and I don't want to give people the impression that Somaliland is where it is because of the Somaliland diaspora. Of course it isn't. The, 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 the situation that Somaliland finds itself in today, which is largely positive, is because of the will of the Somaliland people. Peace and security exists in Somaliland because that's what the people desire. The politicians are simply reacting to the bottom-up approach. And I'm often asked, why is it that Somaliland is relatively peaceful, actually very peaceful, uh, and uh, the, the South Central region is not? I think it's because, if you want to know one simple reason, it's because peace and stability in Somaliland was created from village to village, tribe to tribe, not from the international community top downwards. And I think if there's anything that the Somalilanders can export to their brothers in Mogadishu, it is that. Don't rely on external help. Try to fix it yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much indeed, Mo. Fazia, are you ready? Hello to you all. I would like to take this opportunity to thank African Research Institute for preparing the report and taking the time to come all the way to Somalia, stay and pair with us for a week, uh, go to different places like the hospitals, parliament, speak to different midwives and nurses, go to training institutions, go to um, all these different um, partners and to our other partners and try to get what's going on in Somalia to get the picture, the big picture. I really appreciate um, African Research Institute making possible that I am with you here today, inviting me to this important meeting. I also appreciate you coming here and listening to us and using our report. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. I would like, uh, even though there's a lot in the report, I would still like to tell you a little bit about what Somalia Nursing and Midwifery Association is, where we were when we started and where we are now. Uh, is it the down arrow? Uh, yes. That one. Okay. okay. I will start to tell you a little bit about Somalia at the beginning so that you understand where I am coming from. These are the six regions of Somalia, namely Ausel, Hargeisa, Marudice. Sahil, the capital Berbera, Togder region, which is um, the capital is Kuro, uh, Seoul region, the capital is Las Anon, and Senak region, which the capital is Eregabo. Somalia is located in the Horn of Africa, and it lies between 8 and 11, 27 north, and longitude is 42 to 35 and 49 east. It has borders with uh, Aden in the north, the Yemen, and Somalia in the east, the Federal Republic of Ethiopia in the southwest, and the Republic of Djibouti in the northwest. It covers a total area of 137,600 kilometers square with a coastline of 850 kilometers. The landscape is mostly arid land, 
with, a sh with short rainfalls and no permanent creepers in Somalia. Somaliland has a population of around 3.7 million, uh, they say 99% Muslims, 50% are nomadic people. It's the former British protectorate, it used to be called a British protectorate in the colonial days. Separated from Somalia 20 years ago, and as you heard, even though Somalia is being separated from the rest of Somalia, uh, Somaliland is being separated from the rest of Somalia up to now for 20 years, it's not it's still recognized by the international world. We have a, a, a stable democracy and government structure. I won't go into that because Mark has talked about that. Mm, since 1988 and uh, since the Civil War has started, Somaliland was, can be called a, a poor country. And the health systems were required. <coughs> As you heard before, in, during the Civil War, all the uh, uh, systems has been destroyed by the for Parliament and the shelling and the fighting. Healthcare professionals departed the country or they died in the war. <coughs> there were refugees, there were um, some who were displaced inside the country and some that left and went to refugee camps either in Ethiopia or in other places. As you can also even before the 1990, there was, as you heard, a dictator ruling the country, Somalia, and before the Civil War. Even at that time, you can say the health system was not the in the ideal situation that it should be. Imagine after the Civil War. After the conflict, everything was wasted away by the violence. Uh, there was shortage dire shortage of professionals like doctors, nurses, teachers, so on, because most of them have run for their life and went to other countries. As Mohammed was saying, they are dispersed around the world. Some even died in the war, like I said before. Even the facilities in the urban areas, especially Hargeisa, were bombed and leveled to the ground. And somewhere, even if they were not leveled to the ground, they were vandalized and destroyed. And those who were standing, when people came back from the refugee and the dictator left, uh, they were inhabited by people. They were taken by refugees. And that's why today that you have arguments of fighting these small conflicts because of land is when the government decides to take over that land be taken by people, there are some skirmishes. Like the other day, it was in the news that there was an area that used to belong to the Minister of Health, and it's inhabited by other people, and the Italian government, actually not the government, but an Italian group, said they would like to build a pediatric hospital, and the government wanted to use that site for the hospital. When they decided to move the people from the area, there was uh, skirmishes. Because when people came back, their houses were destroyed. They cannot, you know, sleep in the streets. They were living in those that were standing at that time. The administration in Somalia at that time, and even sometimes now, they don't have the means or the capacity to rehabilitate this uh, health institutions. We are talking about health. Uh, most of the hospitals, the referral hospitals in the six regions were built by the British in 1943, 1942, in those times. And as you can imagine, they are all 
And on top of that, they suffered in the civil war. So they need rehabilitation. Up to now, most of them did not get the refurbishment and the re uh, renovations that they need because the administration or the government that time cannot afford to do that. And oftentimes, those who come to Somalia and support us in the development, they don't have capital funding for rehabilitating those. So that's an issue. And the most critical constraint or challenge as far as the recovery of the health sector is concerned, it still remains the lack of skilled personnel at all levels. Still, that's still an issue. Even though I will come to, um, we have done trainings, we have uh, trained new cadres of the healthcare providers, still we have shortage. And it's under these circumstances that we, the Nursing and Midwifery Association, and the <coughs> two to recognize ourselves, to reorganize ourselves and help in the national recovery um, process. <coughs> in 2004, when I came back to Somalia from Canada, I found myself and other colleagues, we found out that and nurses are facing difficult times. There was a lot of issues. And the issues were so tremendous in a way that it was overwhelming. And we said, if we wait for outside help, it's going to take years or maybe we won't even get it. So we need to unite ourselves, come together, and solve our own problems. And the only way we can do that is to have an association in the past. And at that time, midwife said, okay, we will have the same association as the nurses. And in 2004, November 2004, we started the Somalia Nursing and Welfare Association. At that time, we were a very small group of volunteers. And we started a board, executive board, we started building the systems. And even though we were a small number at that time, we decided to do it. The mandate of the association is to act as both a professional organization and a representative for nurses and midwives within Somalia by protecting, developing, and building their capacity in order for them to deliver quality healthcare services. We try to build their capacity. We try to advocate for them. We try to lobby for them within Somaliland and outside also. <coughs> in 2004 to 2006, we were working as volunteers. And we had consultation meetings with other nurses and midwives. We were placed with uh, the Somaliland Medical Association, who also started in that year. Their association, the doctors also started their association that year. And we were at that time with them. We started to build the systems, the financial systems, uh, we, to register the association you know, the capacity building. 2006-2007, we, uh, there was a, a group called KTSB. KTSB stands for King's College Tech Somalia Partnership. That group already had a relationship with Somalia. They were working with the hospital and board, the regional health board. They were working with Edna Maternity Hospital in 2000, from 2000, they were working with the two universities, Amut and Hargis University. So they already have a working relationship with this family. And since these two organizations, professional organizations, came, the Medical Association and the Nursing Association, we started connection with them. And 
and that's Ted Zuman, uh, King's College, Ted Zuman Lab Partnership. We started working together on a program, writing a proposal on a program that was called an initiative that's called Health Sector Health System Strengthening Program. We came together in a large group because um, if nursing association or medical association or the other actors are working alone to reflect themselves, it's not going to cut it because we have to build all the systems at the same time unless we, are not go unless we do that we are not going to be effective or change anything. So we said let's all come together, the medical association, the nursing association, the universities, the other health training institutions, those international NGOs who are working in the health, like WHO, UNICEF, UNFPA, we all came together and there was a big proposal that was submitted to the FAD at that time. <coughs> the FAD has approved that proposal and TED, in our case, which is nursing and midwifery, it was TED. Tropical Health and Education Trust, who was working with us, who was our partner with the support of funding from DFID, Department of International, UK Department of International Development. And I would really like to take this opportunity to thank TED for their hard work, for their support, because some people, when they do a job, it's just a job. But to them, it was not just a job. They did it with passion. They worked it along beside us, coming to Somalia, working from here, and it was very, very helpful. Because at that time, we needed all the help we can get in order to be somewhere or be somebody or to do, to achieve our goals. I really appreciate the work that Ted was doing with us. I really also would like to thank and thank DFID for their support. We still get Somalia National Association, the institutions, the hospital, the universities, we all still get capacity building from Ted. When the HSSB, which is Health System Strengthening Program, which the uh, Minister of Health was included, was started. We were supported with human resources and we hired staff like the executive director, program officer, and others. At that time, we were working blindly and we said we cannot work like this until we do a proper assessment and do survey how many nurses are in the country, where are they, who are the midwives we are talking about, and we did a survey in all the six regions. We did an inventory of nurses and midwives cadre at all regional levels. And when we finished that, based on the findings of that assessment, we started uh, developing some systems like the CPD, which is continuous professional development for nurses and midwives, and that's based on the needs that the nurses and midwives told us in the assessment. However, we found out because <coughs> there was no training, there was no proper training before Edna started high school, and there was, um, for 11 years, when people were in the refugee camp, they didn't get any training. Edna started in 2000, and she um, produced it, I think. And the first group graduated in 2003. Her Gazing Institute of Health Science was closed all those time. But we restarted the training in 2000. It restarted in 2003, and the first group graduated in 2006. But what I mean from that is, they had no proper or constructive training.
training. They didn't get any refresher courses except when day to day here, there by the international organization, a seminar, a conference, but nothing con um, constructive. They didn't have upgrading or refresher or nothing. So that's why we started with the CBD program and developing the CBD framework for nurses and midwives. We also did another assessment for the training institutions because we wanted to know, we wanted to do an audit for the teachers. Are they qualified nurses? Are they qualified teachers? Are they enough? Do they have the necessary equipment, whether it's teaching tools or training tools? Uh, and we did that also. We also, um, we found out that even the teachers did not get the upgrading or refresher they need. They have the same problems with other people. They have come back from refugee camps. Their skills are rusty. They haven't practiced it for quite some time. They didn't get any refresher. The teachers themselves need capacity building, CBD also. And then we established three chapters in three regional offices at that time, and later on two others. So now we have chapters or sub-offices in all the six regions of Somalia. And in each region we have a committee working in that region. <coughs> At the beginning we were working with three nursing and midwifery schools and now but now we are working with five because there are other schools that were started after. <coughs> the other thing we found out when we, we did the assessment for these schools, we found out that there is no nursing and midwifery education standards. Each school had their own curriculum and they train with their curriculum, when they come to the clinical areas, they are functioning at different levels. So in order to standardize that, we decided to do um, develop some new curriculums and review the older ones. <coughs> SLMA facilitated our participation in the development of three new curriculums. One, when we did the assessment for these schools, we found out that not only their skills are rusty, but there is a shortage of nursing and midwifery teachers. So with the support of DFID TET, we trained 26 nurses to be nurse tutors. So in order to do those 26, we have to do, develop a nurse tutor training curriculum for them. So we developed that one with the support of <coughs> that. And then with the Bachelor of Science degree we started in 2006 in Amun. And we, we worked with Amun group to have that curriculum also. The midwifery and BSc or Bachelor of Science in, in midwifery curriculum was developed also with the support of TED. And we had a, a consultant who came to us and supported us in the development of this new curriculum. This one was new, this one was new, and the total one was new, but there was a most basic midwifery and curriculum that was um, developing and it was for those who finished three years nursing and did 18 months midwifery. The other one is um, the General Club Nursing Three Year Diploma Program and that's the one we did best because each school was using different ones. Some were using the WHO one some were using one that's developed by Edna, different ones. And we took all those and combined them 
with um, adding them the nutrients and using the international aspect also we developed a general class nursing diploma curriculum that's applicable to the Somalian uh, context. <coughs> this is one of the one of the, when we are developing a curriculum, the Ministry of Health usually helps us setting up a committee that comprises of the international consultant, WHO, and we include UNICEF, the different uh, institutions, university, and the curriculum department of the Ministry of Education. And this is one of the sessions that we will come together and talk about it. Based on that findings, the assessment we done, <coughs> at that time we developed a three-year strategic planning. Uh, we developed the CPD framework, I talked about that, and we hired a CPD coordinator to do the CPD trainings in all the regions. And later on we also had, the CPD coordinator was a nurse, <coughs> but later on we hired also a CPD coordinator assistant who is a midwife so that we have all, both. <coughs> we also um, talked and did the standardization of training institution examinations <laughs> and then registration of graduate students. We attend at the examinations at the beginning, entry, and again when they are graduating the final exams. We, we monitor that as an association. We have a, a committee that goes to the different schools to see that the examinations are fair, that the competencies are there, and fair. We collaborate with the Minister of Health to develop health workers for emotional remuneration. The Minister of Health and the Labour, they contact us. I have to go back so that you understand what I mean by that. When we were Somalia, the registers were at the Minister of Health. When people graduate, they are put in the register, and the registers were at the Minister of Health. And before, in the previous Somalia, if you want to find someone who is a graduate or qualified, you go to the Ministry and check the register. There were two registers, three registers to Somalia, two nursing schools in Mogadishu and the one in Hagesia, Somalia. Luckily, one nurse brought the registers from Somalia before um, they were destroyed like the other things, and he brought them to Somalia. <coughs> and we had the one from the Somaliland nursing school. So we took these registers and whatever nursing, and um, those who took post-nursing, post post uh, um, registered nursing education to be teachers, those who did the basic midwifery, those who did not, all were in the register. What we did at that time, with the support <coughs> of our partner, we, did, we bought a, a software and we put all this in, in a data bank. All this we put in, in a data bank and now we have a data bank of all nurses and midwives. Not only in Somalia, but of all Somalia. So we have nurses calling us from UK, USA, saying, you know, I graduated that year, can you please give me a, I want to work or I want to go back to school. So now we are helping with international organizations when they are hiring staff. They come to us and say, we are hiring staff, can you please check for your assistance? if this person is qualified or not. What we also did, those who graduated uh, after the Civil War, we added into the register, we registered them also. So they are all in the register. So now we are sort of helping people to get uh, I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have not. We also established a website 
and you can go to our website, it's uh, www.slma.org. We develop it also when we finish that one, another five years strategy planning on open 2010. I think I'm not going to talk more about it because I don't have much time, but I will go over this. We establish a quality control competency audit system where we assess the nurses and we do an assessment. And as you saw in the first picture, they were wearing a card. That's the one we get those who go under the assessment, the card that says whether they are qualified midwife, qualified nurse, their picture. One other thing is, when we started all this, we found out this is not enough. We are still limping, walking in one leg. We don't have the regulation or the legality, nursing legality. Any doctor can come to Somalia and practice, say I'm a doctor, and there is no way to verify that. So we were advocating the two organizations and SLMA and SMA with Somalia and Medical so we were advocating for two years to get the health professional counsel to do the accreditation and registration of health providers. And luckily, we have that now with the basics. There's the health regulations. There was a law, an act, signed by the parliament in 1999, but it was not successful to the part that it was actually functioning. But now, the law is amended. The organization exists. It has the executive director program of staff, and it's functioning now, and they are laying the basis, and they are close to actually accrediting the health providers, also doing accreditation for health institutions. These are the nurse tutors I was telling you about. That one is six nurse tutors who have taken their 15 months um, nurse tutor training. And that's their graduation in 2009. <coughs> These are the trainings and the, the different things that were going on. And so uh, you, can, you can see that. I don't need to read. I think you can all see it. Yes. yes. They were training in different things. And here, as you can see, we had different partners. But there is a system also we have we call it rewarding and recognizing uh, providers that are either excelling in nursing education, midwifery education, or excelling in their work. In our annual general meeting, we recognize them, call them the nurse. This one is holding the nurse of the year. <laughs> Just to encourage them so that, you know, they do more and be a role model for the others. This is another one. We do not only train now for, from nurses in Somalia. For, since last year, we are also training nurses from Somalia, from the rest of Somalia. This group of people came from the other region. And we, our partners were Tet and Trocare, and we were asked to train nurses and midwives from, since there's fighting there, and it's difficult to train people in the south. Sometimes they bring them to Somalia and then we train them and they go back. We don't do only training in the class, we also do hands-on thing. This is one of the basic emergency of obstetric care that we give to the midwives. And it's a, as you can see, it's hands-on thing. They are in the lab. And sometimes they also go to breaths in the hospital, the CPD. And this is one of the Clusting. Uh, that's the car I was telling you, that all nurses and midwives, they should carry a car showing their name, whether they are qualified midwife, whether they are a, a qualified nurse. 
they have um, different uniforms now. Qualified and um, registered nurses, they have brown and white. Midwives have pink. <laughs> pink, pink and white. And these are the most basic midwives who graduated in 2010. Do you mind if I finish this talk? <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the lessons, some of the lessons I learned is when an escapable fact is the requirement of more strategic external support, especially in the development of required health infrastructure, because it's very important. We train people, but if they don't have, uh, sometimes we train them and they come back to us because the area, the infrastructure they are supposed to work does not have the equipment they were training on, or the building itself is in shambles. It doesn't have a sink where they can wash their hands. We are teaching them the universal precautions. We are teaching them to wash their hands for infection control, but they don't have the sink. So we need to rehabilitate the health the institutions, the, mainly the hospitals. So we still need support in that area. We found out unity creates a synergy. That's a fact. Because working together with international support, we have achieved a lot. If we work together, we, will, we can achieve more. So working together, I mean the Ministry of Health, the other uh, actors, and universities, we were all working together. And when you have um, collaboration and coordination and this type of you know, good working relationship, you can achieve more. So that's very important. Uh, we also need to have a national, we found out that we have to have a national <coughs> human resource planning to overcome shortage or redundancy and poverty and focus on priorities. We must have, we can't say, oh, train, 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 no. We need to have a plan. For example, we have shortage of mental health nurses. We have shortage of uh, public health nurses. We have to plan. What are we going to do this year? We need that plan from the ministry level. What the, some of the challenges were, even though we're talking about many achievements, the challenge still remains on how this can be sustained, maintained, and built upon. That's one challenge we, have to, we are facing and we have to overcome. As I said earlier, the most critical constraint, as far as the recovery of the health sector is concerned, is lack of skilled personnel at all levels. We still need skilled people. The other thing is inadequate salaries to attract and retain qualified staff. We find sometimes someone who is qualified but who comes back from the diaspora or <coughs> still was inside but we don't have the salary that person deserves because of the financial situation, the economical situation of the country. And this is also compounded by the status of be, not being recognized at this time and not getting by that funding or support. Minimal sunlight. This also brings moonlighting. Do you know what moonlighting is? <laughs> when I say moonlighting, it means when people are not getting enough salaries, they tend to look for another job. They are working in the hospital this morning. In the afternoon, they are going to a private doctor's clinic. In the evening, they go to Edna. You can imagine that person's time when they come to the public hospital in the morning. They cannot be effective or function the way they are supposed to. And they are working because they are doing that because salary is not enough. They have to be a roof over their head. They have to feed their children. So they have to do that. And I understand why. Even though 
the new finance minister has increased the salaries 100 percent is still not enough. There is also, at the higher level, lack of required supervision and management, whether it's the health center, whether it's the <coughs> hospital, there's not enough uh, the required supervision and management. It's not up to the level we wanted. There's no performance appraisal. Some, some are not based on performance. And that's something we need to work on. <coughs> For us, SLMA, one other challenge is to get a resource center for nurses and midwives, a central resource center in the main capital city, which, a uh, which would be a national resource <coughs> center where they have a library, where they will have to research, to do review exams, you know, and when they come from the regions where they can, you know, stay and we have maybe some hostel attached to it. We were thinking of that. Um, have you printed? There's details inside the policy voice, yeah. Okay. That's another challenge for us. Uh, another challenge is we want to, those who graduated from Ali with the Bachelor of Science in, in Nursing, we want them to go to, to have the master. That's in, those who graduated for maybe the total program or the other nursing program, they would like to take their bachelor's. So we don't have support to advance nursing education. We have midwifery because we already started the midwifery degree at the University of Hargeisa and Edna, supported by DFAD. We have that program and it's going well, but I'm talking about nursing. The other one is, oftentimes we don't have reliable data for appropriate planning from the minister at central level. You need to have stats, you need to have um, appropriate data so that you can do your appropriate planning. Our partner is our Minister of Health and Labor, Tropical Health and Education Trust, UK Department of International Funding, King's College Hospital London, UNFPA, UNICEF, Somaliland Wales Link in Cardiff, Royal College of Office and Gynecologists International Office, Health Unlimited, which also called it uh, Health <laughs> Population <laughs> Services International, which is BSI. We always call them. We always call them in health unlimited. So, thank you very much for listening. I tried. I tried to be short, and I <laughs> and I omitted a lot of things, including the newsletter that we developed for nurses. I tried to omit a lot of things, but still, I took a long time. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank it you is your your right and privilege, and thank you for thank very you for very much with me. We forgive you for that. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Um, I will, I'd just like to say one or two words of summary because I know we have uh, run over rather and some of you will have to leave before we have the chance to discuss things. It, it struck me when I first arrived, it's absolutely remarkable that uh, you know, in November 2004 when this association was founded there were seven people at the founding meeting and they had no idea how many nurses and mid midwives qualified there were in the country. Now, I think that gives us all a, uh, a, uh, an, a, a good impression of the scale of the challenge that was confronting them. The first thing to do was actually find out how many health professionals there were in the country. The second thing I would mention is that in the 2010 budget, for various reasons, uh, Somaliland has a, 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 a minuscule, I think one would say, government budget. In 2010, the, the government budget for the Ministry of Health 
for a population that may be three and a half million people thereabouts was one and a half million dollars a million quid this does not go very far now my point here is that in order to get anywhere Fauzia and her colleagues and her international partners had to go about things in a very different way and they did so in a way that I think uh, uh, holds up many valuable lessons to people who find themselves in similar situations in, in post-conflict states anywhere else on the continent or, or anywhere in the world and this issue of building uh, capacity in people and building skills is critical. Unfortunately, Andy Leather, who is the senior consultant at King's College Hospital, who has been working with Somaliland as part of the partnership since 2000, he couldn't be with us here today. But if you ask this question of Andy, what about the shocking state of the, of the, health, of the infrastructure, of the, of the hospitals and so forth, he will say... Forget that for the moment. There is no point in having fantastic new bricks and mortar if you haven't got the experts to man them. And he said the, absolutely the vital thing for us at King's and Tropical Health and Education Trust to do in partnership with the SLLMA and the other professional associations is to build expertise. And you can do an awful lot in a very shoddy hospital if your staff are, are competent and motivated and properly rewarded. So I think I would just like to, to, to sum up by saying that the people and the partnerships are what absolutely shine through uh, from this story. And Paul Fauzia, it's a great deal more detail in the, in the, in the policy voice. And I, I'm sorry that I had to uh, cut you short. And I hope that some of you will be able to, uh, to stay and to discuss, perhaps in greater detail, some of the, uh, the remaining great challenges. We touched on mental health. The mental health issue in Somaliland is absolutely dire. Uh, every family is affected by uh, mental health problems and this affects the health and functioning of the nation so these issues are, are absolutely of critical importance but I will shut up now and I would just like to uh, say a, a, a very great thanks to Michael who I hope will stay but I don't know what his timings are for a bit to participate in the discussion uh, ditto to Mo and most of all thank you very much indeed to Fazia for coming all this way and for uh, giving us the, the, the benefit of her of her expertise but also a demonstration of her very considerable in my opinion courage Thank you. No, there is no law yet. They are talking the Ministry of Family and Social Affairs and other partners are working on a policy now. And I think the policy will be taken from that, and I mean the law would be taken from that policy and would be, I heard it would be taken to the parliament but up to now there's no law that says, you know, you will be imprisoned or you will be pirated or if you do this, you know, we are not there yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm Barbara, um, I work with SET and other people around. I can just add to what... Um, was he has said in the FGM and the gender based violence in general is going into all the curricula post primary for nursing and midwifery. I don't know about medicine now. It is, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's been incorporated into the nursing curriculum. FGM is also uh, one of the modules in the nursing curriculum module. And now it's taught in the uh, nursing institutions. But I'm saying there's no law after now, Mr. Mandela. But there's a lot of education going on about it here by different partners. Yes. Okay. My name is Rocky Ismail, and I run an organization called Back to Basics My Arts. And I would like to say that basically what Fozia has done is amazing. And I would like to also thank uh, Edward for uh, his own time taking to go to Somaliland. 
And in terms of policy and uh, governance, I think Somaliland has come a long, long way. And I think we have to give it time for these things to take. It's time to get this policy in place because for Zia, what she has done is something no Somali has done and someone we really look up to and appraise for the work she's done. If, if I could just say, as for the composition of the panel, it's Edward's fault. <laughs> and the second thing I'd like to say is it's true, I am a man, and uh, I suppose I should apologize for that. But um, the, the more important point is that um, the point that I'm often struck by whenever I visit Somaliland, which is now virtually every other month, is the role of women. It's something which isn't sort of really uh, appreciated or understood in the West. We have this, if you read the Daily Mail, if you listen to various uh, people, the impression given is that women, particularly in Somaliland, are uh, oppressed and uh, are very much second-class citizens. It's true that there are other, there are aspects of uh, Somali or Muslim society which is which are very different from the West. But the difference doesn't make them inferior. They're different. And I think on any objective level, on, on the issues that really matter, you know, um, perhaps not the ones that really show, women are far, far more powerful in Somaliland than they're given credit for. Actually, I think it's very much a matriarchal society. At the end of the day, women rule. Main bark. <laughs> and uh, Michael would just like to. Uh, <coughs> um, some. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not going to apologise for my gender, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just in Somaliland until a couple of weeks ago doing a small research project on women's political participation in Somaliland. So it's probably worth just commenting very briefly on that. Um, women are, as Mohammed says, very, um, very active in many sectors in Somali society but um, there are some there are some difficulties for women in terms of public representation um, and they're, they're quite difficult to it's quite difficult to work out how to change those there are proposals such as political quotas for women in parliament and local elections which it seems likely there will be a quota introduced but that is precisely to try to change a system where women are seen as not representing a given clan um, and actually it's that that makes it so hard for for women to take up a higher profile in my experience um, position because people say so who are you are you from your father's clan or from your husband's clan and that in that does constrain women's participation in many aspects of Somali society it also hides what is real participation and I think that that's the, the truth in what Mohammed's saying about sort of women being much more influential than they seem to be. One comment I got was actually women make all the decisions but we pretend not to because we don't want to challenge men's feeling that they're in power. Which actually was a pretty good way of summing up I think a, a situation. I'm interested does SNMA have a, an explicit policy on FGM? Because that is something that I know is one of the, the areas that's been dealt with. I know you talked about having it in the curriculum, mm -hmm. but do you, do you make a statement as an association on, on that practice? If, yeah, we do a lot of trainings. We also develop with a curriculum that we train health providers and they know it's not acceptable. It's, uh, yeah, we, do, we don't have the law, as I said, but yeah. we, ha we talk on uh, every training and each location to the midwives, we train them. And according to my experience, and when I talk, when I say my experience, I was one of the uh, three women who were calling Horn of Africa Research and Resource Group, and that was based in Canada. And for 16 years I, uh, that I worked on FGM in Canada, I found out I, yes, I have gained an experience that uh, educational support is more powerful than legality. Because when you uh, tend to talk about legality, imprisonment, and all that, people take the practice to underground. Like you said, they take their kids to Africa or other places and they do it. But I found that when I was 
in the clinic, and I was working in the clinic in the area, and a mother comes with a well baby check or, you know, what, comes with a baby. While I am weighing the baby and doing my things, I will talk to the mother. Are you planning to circumcise your daughter? Do you know that it has its health complications? Are you aware it's not a religious requirement? When you talk to the woman, they say, no, I won't do it. But I found out when they are in prison and all, you know, it's not, it doesn't work most of the time. So that's my experience. Because we did, um, in Canada, we did about 300 presentations on FGM to the health providers, teachers, social workers, and other people. We also did uh, consultations and talking to women because we were working in the health directory and in the women directory in the Minister of Health in Canada. And I found out that education and support is very important. Make them understand that there's no need to do it in the first place. That's a very important message. Thank you. Would anyone like to add something on this particular point? Or on women's participation I, I in general? FGM in terms of Islamically is wrong and if we Somali women educate our sisters in terms of Islamic and health issue that will not happen and I have worked in schools in London for over 10 years and I have come across lots of different mothers when you talk to them and talk about the health issues and about religion these things they kind of like wake up call and say, oh yes, we can do it. And it doesn't happen as people actually talk about it as much because recently, not so recently, but I, have, I often go to Somaliland and when I talk to people about FGM, they kind of like think it's not the norm, it's the thing of the past and it's all through education. And I think that's what we have to focus on further on. That's very interesting, this Sorry. issue of education. Yeah. Sure. The, the key of educa um, edu um, education is key to this, and what Fozia is doing and what's happening in Somalia um, shows that the power of women that I've experienced in my um, um, childhood and adulthood mm -hmm. that women have led the way, with, uh, whether it's in the diaspora, whether it's back home. But what I'm talking about in terms of FGM is that we, as a community and as a and as um, as a collective, to 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 deal with these issues, have other than said that it's it's not happening. And I think we have to listen to the nuances of the language that we use. Sometimes we say circumcision or FGM, and we talk about in in, in our native language, um, type, which is type three, that's defined by the World Health Organization. But other women will not, will not define type one as they define as Sunnah as as FGM. So I think to say that it's not happening negates the fact that there's a lot of young women and children that are at risk and are suffering. And a recent report that, that was done by the GLA that that was commissioned said that 3,000 girls in London alone are at risk of FGM, and that's an understatement I think personally. So I would like to say that if, even if one child's at risk, it's still not ended. So I just don't like the fact to say that FGM is it's not happening anymore because it is happening and it's a fight and it's a violation of women's rights and children's rights and it goes alongside other forms of gender-based violence. So if those are happening, then FGM is still happening as well. Thank you. It's happening. It's happening. We yeah. are yeah. denying it's yeah. happening, but I'm saying nurses are not doing it now. No, that's fine. You said, I'll say to you, if I ask that question and, 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 and you said that I accept that, and that's, I wasn't... Having, but I'm saying the fact that we're having this conversation and there's probably a lot of influential people that are here but to take that back to the community to say it's, it's not happening and that's what policy makers will, will hear within the diaspora then that will mean that the um, work that needs to be done to protect these young people is not going to happen. So yeah. I think okay. just point. say it's not point. Just, Thanks, just Michael. The, the briefest comment a few years ago was in the area between Filter and Dolorado in um, Ethiopia near the uh, border with the south, in the south. And they had some success. I haven't been back. I would be interested to know what, what's happened since. But they had some success because they got some imams to, to say specifically that FGM was not, not Islamic, was un-Islamic. Yeah. And that seemed to, be, seemed to achieve a real, a real change in people's attitudes. So I think your, your comment before is perhaps one of the helpful directions things could go in that. Any more? Yeah. Yes. Borodá, first of all, Corso. Do you speak Welsh? Anyone speak Welsh? <laughs> 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 
Uh, this is me. Good afternoon or good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the two events and us today for your, for your launch, for your research. And I'm very appreciated and very I mean, lucky to be here today. And what I want to say something about Fozia, which I'm not, I'm not going to take long. I met Fozia a year and a half ago in Cardiff. That's the first time I met Fozia. And funny enough, it was our holiday in Eid, which she gave her time for us women in Cardiff in Wales to show us what she does in, in Somalia in Somalia and this the universities and we, we what happened she enlightened us and she informed us so 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 much. What we did we collect some fun and we pass on to her and she was the first one who promised because we we've been doing as a diaspora collect money to send back home. She promised and she did. It was the first person very important in Somalia that came to Cali, who promised and she achieved her promise. What she did, she documented the money we gave it to her to help in Somalia. She documented, she put a CD and she sent back and we showed the ladies back home, which is where she was going to be back home in Cali. <laughs> and which is very, very good. Just I want to say that. And I Could I, reason. sorry, can I just interrupt just quickly? Yes. <laughs> so then you can do us both at once. Oh, I, uh, thank you very much for coming from Cardiff. That's a, it's a tremendous effort and we very much appreciate you, you coming here to contribute. And I, I would just like to agree entirely with what you said. One of the, one of the great joys of producing this publication uh, is that Fauzia is always there on the end of the phone. She always answers a question quickly. Uh, and not all the authors with whom we've collaborated, <laughs> I can tell you, are like that. And it has been a an absolute joy. And I'm not making... Uh, the, the, well, the reason why I'm making this point is that this, of course, is the success... Of, uh, 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 the secret of the success of the association. You know, Fazia is available to everyone, to every stakeholder, everyone interested. She's on Facebook too. 20, and she's on Facebook <laughs> 24 hours a day. <laughs> and, Twitter. and uh, you know, her work never ceases. So I, I'd like to... No, I just want to thank uh, Kamal and, and Kinsey for coming all the way from Cali. But uh, I want to tell Kinsey that the bed sheets, the blankets, and the pillows, and the mattress are now in the hospital. I, I got an email from the director, the new director of the hospital, mm -hmm. and he told me that they again worship the hospital, and I put all the new things, and thanks to you all for those who contributed to that fundraising. I really appreciate it. This is an interesting issue about Hargeza Group Hospital, which many of you know far better than I do, that there is at least a director there now. Uh, now there have been directors in, directors out, periods with no directorship, and uh, again reverting to what uh, you know, Andy Leather would say, or, or any of the nurses and midwives here, you, know, you, you, can't, you cannot run a national referral hospital without a director. I mean, it's just, it's like an aircraft carrier, it's got to have a skipper. So. Um, I don't know uh, Faduma well, I've met her twice, uh, and I wish her all the luck with running this very large institution and, and actually uh, uh, achieving within um, uh, a very difficult environment um, you know, the, the maximum that is possible. Well, yeah, yes, madam. Hi, I'm um, Moel Bikan, and I'm a trustee of FED, and I'm the, also the immediate past president of the Royal College of Nursing. I just want to congratulate you here on outstanding leadership. You know, it's my belief that, and I might be biased, that well, health is the prerequisite of wealth in any country, and it will be gained through the medics and their great advanced technologies that will actually be gained through nursing and midwifery. I believe they're the fundamental. And in my time as president, I was the representative of the UK on the International Council of Nurses and had the pleasure to meet other nurse leaders from Africa. And, and it was women, South Africa, Kenya, Malawi, and now in Somaliland, that it was women in nursing that showed outstanding leadership despite all the challenges. So, you know, I think we've done fantastic. I think we could learn a lot here. From the, the interesting, leaders. interesting. Yeah, losing leaders, and I think Africa's certainly got some. Thank, you. Thank, thank, thank you, Mara. Thank you. Thank you. Just continuing to the uh, Hagesa General Hospital, um, 
we see the capacity building in the nursing part, you know, maybe some doctors and some uh, midwifery, but we don't see any build-up on hospital administrators. And what is so crucial when I visited some of the hospitals is that the hospitals are not about doctors. Doctors do not run hospitals. It's about administering hospital, running a hospital. It's almost and everywhere you go, you see that is the main thing that lacks for hospitals in, in Somalia or even in many third world countries. Mm. Um, and there, there must be some kind of a way of building some capacity building on administrative mm. hospital administrative systems in Somalia because the hospital in general hospital in Abisa is not breaking down into pieces by lack of doctors or nurses somewhat yes but lack of simple administrative system there's no system uh, yeah. and I think um, Rachel wants to comment on that so we just had a chance so just to add that we completely not agree I think the general feeling is that the chair. Sorry, can you uh, stand up, Peter? No, I just want to know who you were. Introduce your fellow Peter. So, um, I'm a former member of the FET. I worked for thousand and four, four years as the, um, the nursing midwifery coordinator at FET. Um, and we involved in other areas, but just to say that very, you've hit the nail on the head, we completely agree, and as Edward says, it concurs with the comments that Andy Lerdo has made. We did try um, to support the director, but there was a changeover for a long time. There was a temporary administrator in charge. And under the previous, uh, well, essentially, we did give some support. We sent out a consultant that worked there for three months, working and looking at how you could generate income support. The hospital didn't even have an open bank account, mm. not even an open bank account. So you couldn't end up, and obviously most people didn't know that it's feet on the wall but there was no way of actually being able to account for the money coming into the ward. There was no way of being able to account for the, uh, the needs of the different wards, the different size, you know, obviously some more wards have more beds than others, uh, but the allocation of funds given out was just blankets, and this was something we really tried to work hard with. We provided support to the hospital administrator, finance gentleman, and the person who was acting in charge as hospital director at the time. Those reports are still there, and we keep circulating them when we can. I think there's sort of two, there's a few aspects. We've also run leadership and management trainings where we invited along the local um, administrators and people from the regional health boards. But there is an element, I think, as, as this lady said before, of timing. You know, you can have everything in place, but if the timing isn't right, then perhaps it's not going to be built up. But all you hope is that that information is there. Keep trying to remind people it's there, and it can get picked up in the future. But yeah, sadly, sometimes you've got to wait till the time is right. The issue, you know, leadership is, uh, I think everyone here would agree, that the, you know, the record keeping and administration is, is, is absolutely, uh, you know, intimately linked with leadership. Um, it, you know, you have to set the example and, and uh, having the right director and the right other staff in an institution is, is absolutely critical. Um, and it happened that the person who was uh, acting as the administrator of Metron was not, does not have the skills. And that's why we were asking for a nurse who is uh, qualified, either nurse or midwife. And now we have the nurse. The other thing is, lately there was a doctor who was a director at the hospital, but he has his own practice, his own clinic, private. So it was not working. That's why now the Minister of Health has appointed a midwife who is also a nurse as a director of the hospital now. I hope, we are hoping that things will improve, but I'm not saying everything is rosy and perfect. But referring back to your point, Nimo, as well, this is, you know, I know small encouragements, but it, it, it's never happened before that there's been a director of Hargeza Group Hospital who is, uh, who is a, ma is who's a matron. We have here in the which UK the, our own um, minister, our Department of Health and um, the Royal College that, that, that we have, in, like, you know, endorsed FGM through other forms and other names of the labioplasty. So I'm saying there's like, you know, there are always things to learn and we always have to talk about the rights of women within these kind of things as opposed to things being constructed around them, they need to be constructed alongside what we need as women as children. So 
Oh. Yes. Hi, I'm Please. Laura Helen from the School of Oriental African Studies. Um, let me just add my voice of admiration for Kazi and the work that you're doing. I wanted to ask whether, um, you mentioned that the problem of training and training and wondering perhaps where your graduates go, and I wondered if you could say a little bit more about any efforts that are ongoing to try to, to take the expertise that you're generating to use it in, within the public health field. So I think this is an issue not only for health, the healthcare sector, but as well for other kind of sectors with lots of graduates emerging into my land and not very many jobs. Available. As I said, that was the challenge for us. Um, the reason I said that sometimes we graduate nurses, but we don't have the jobs. Uh, and sometimes the other thing is there are priorities. Like we said, mental health nurses and public health nurses. Are we dealing? Are we dealing with this? Are we taking care of that? That's the question that comes to mind. But. And within the health sector, uh, health system strengthening program, there was a capacity building for the human resource department at the Ministry of Health and Labor. So now, and um, I think they are ready to take that part, and they they posted in their last coordination meeting that they are working on the national planning. So if that comes, it would be very helpful because sometimes you will see when school training about uh, maybe 180 nurses that approach me. There are questions that come to mind. And we and um, we can advise, we can advocate, we can but we are not the authority to say no to this, we are not that as association. So that's why we are but we can advocate and we are doing we are advocating for that. Hi, uh, so Sorry. my name is Samia Thornton, and I'm just to add to Fazi's last point. I think it speaks to really one of the lessons learned that Fazi mentioned on her um, presentation, which is issues around um, health system strengthening are um, broad issues across not just the health sector, but across all issues around governance and training and uh, community needs that a country like Somaliland needs to address and that everybody needs to get on board with those things. There are many, many partners, both local and international, who have a part to play in good human resource and health workforce planning. Uh, and the work that not just that, but lots of other partners are doing with um, central government and also regional government really requires, and you can put a lot of technical inputs in, you can give a lot of uh, resources to improve the situation around health workforce planning, but it's really something that everybody has to get on board with and everybody has to have the same agenda and uh, get on board with policies that are created within Somaliland and led by Somaliland organisations like the SNMMA. Um, and I would just say from um, a kind of outsider's point of view, I've been incredibly impressed over the last couple of years at the, the real development and real progress that um, organisations like the SNMA and the Ministry of Health have made around improvements in health workforce planning and hopefully over the next few years some of the fruits of that labour will really be seen um, on the ground in facilities and for services for patients in Somalia. Thank you. No. Very brief. My name is Mahmoud Hassan from Noah International. Um, I was I had a question for uh, Sia and maybe looking for a solution for Mohammed Yusuf um, and adding on Laura's uh, issue of uh, this issue about graduates uh, in relation to the opportunities when you've got a pool of graduates that are um, graduating from the university every year um, uh, without any sort of uh, 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 prospects uh, as to where they're going. So now the solution for those uh, graduates is, 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 is to go out of the country, um, which, which is seen as an increasing problem. Um, so I don't know how, how, how big the problem is, but maybe you could sort of enlighten us on that issue. And maybe to Mohammed, is there anything that can be done for those youngsters uh, using sort of your own uh, experience and expertise? Uh, maybe you can go ahead. I'm 
the issue of unemployment amongst the, the young in Somalia is an acute problem. It's an acute problem here, but I think it, it's, it's amplified in Somaliland by the fact there's a security element attached to it as well. Um, the, the pay of a recruit to Al-Shabaab <coughs> is less than five dollars. It doesn't actually take that much to recruit somebody to Al-Shabaab. The number of uh, youngsters in the south <coughs> as well as the north who, are, who have no hope increases enormously by the day. There's an enormous amount of intellectual energy and cash that comes from the West, America and Great Britain in particular, that's, that is called aid, but is really directed at security. And the belief is that the more secure that the Horn of Africa becomes, the less of a threat that that will be to, to the UK and the streets of San Francisco. To answer your question, in my opinion, I think if less money that comes from that budget is put into security type projects and more is put into the type of projects that will create employment and by that I don't mean um, NGO type structures but to, to fund, to seed fund small scale private enterprise the more money from government and private enterprise that goes into that area I think the more secure we will be. So the paradox is if you spend less directly mm. on security and more on the business of creating jobs, the more secure people will be here. Let me just add in my post here. Is there a link between graduate students and outward migration? And actual in graduate and and outward migration. Students, students who graduate and leave the country. Is there a link between the two? There are some, but it's not more pronounced in the health. It's more on the those young people who are graduating with MAS, um, business administration, and other areas, because there are large numbers, and they are graduating from all the universities in Somaliland, and there are no jobs available for them, and that's why they are migrating. And that's when we see a lot of human trafficking, um, all that. It's a cruel irony, to, uh, as an outsider, to, to me, that you know, uh, institutions like Amud University and, and others were set up uh, with this, uh, uh, and, and funded by the community and the diaspora specifically to try and keep people in the country and stop this happening. And, and, and now, yes, more and more young people are being retained for longer, but once they're out of university now, as opposed to out of school or earlier, then there is, so it, it goes on and on. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Funny enough, what we what we did the last two years in the Somali West Somali family who live in Cali, hmm. we advise the families, the kids or the youth who do nurses and doctors for first or second year in university when they go home back home Somaliland to do the holidays, you advise them to go to doctor school in hospitals because of volunteer works and see how they can just organize and what happened when they came back the, those youth for example nurses or doctors they they, they was amazed especially girls the boys and the issue but the girls <laughs> <laughs> they honestly they were so amazed and the, the loving and the effort they put this to finish the study here and then go back in Somaliland to help hmm. and do good things hmm. that's hmm. what we did the last two years uh, that's interesting and it's very impact yes yeah. had it. Is somebody right at the back? I can't see who it is, sorry. Uh, my name is uh, Ahmed Adi. No, it is. Hi. Nice to, <laughs> nice to see you again, Ahmed. <laughs> I'm uh, a volunteer page for Kuzia. I, I wanted to just add a point to that. You, you had mentioned earlier that uh, there's no need of investment of infrastructure. But the more we produce graduates who do not have anywhere to go and work, the more we produce outdoor migration. Because there's no any investment in infrastructure in Somalia, be it in healthcare or education. There's no even any support, a proper support for the government to have the capacity required to absorb these graduates. And that's why we have the same problem that we have. 
Yeah, sorry, I wasn't saying there's no need for infrastructure spending. Uh, my, my point was that, uh, that health professionals say that uh, you know, when you're confronted with a need to do everything, the first thing to do is to get the, the people trained. It's not um, a point, but that is the general perception of it, all the aid giving organizations within that part of the country. At the moment, they're investing a lot on uh, uh, developing the skills and uh, developing systems. But these institutions don't have any base. You can, you can have all the manpower that you need, but if they don't have a place where they can go in, deliver the, the capacity. Or, or wash in a sink, as, as far as you were saying. Yeah, no, I accept that. that. Now, they have reached a place where, without having their own center, the services will be just all over the place and they won't have their own place where they can effectively develop their own uh, agendas. Mm. Sure. We have reached a stage where we need more investment on infrastructure within that country. Yes. yes. Gillian. I think this guy was holding longer than he Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 sorry. Gillian, can I see the uh, yeah. mark? Okay. Um, if I may, thank you so much for your presentation. It's really inspiring what's happening in the cities. Uh, my name is Mark Jones. I'm here with a number of hats, but actually I'm UK correspondent at Somaliland Press. Um, if I could possibly ask, as Somaliland is essentially a semi-pastoralist and pastoralist society, what is being done with regard to community out outreach workers to take your excellent work to those remote communities where many of the very poorest people are living without access to hospitals or clinics? Or if you could possibly touch on that. Actually, um, our, our uh, captains or sub offices in the regions, they do the outreach in, the all, in their own regions. So because there are, uh, each region has its own districts and villages. So the chapters are, uh, in, in regard to our office, our sub-offices, each sub-office is responsible for own, its own villages and they do, they do health promotion, they do trainings, they, do, they talk about a lot of things. And even the students at the nursing institutions they do community outreach and they go out to the community and they talk about different things like breastfeeding, sanitation, a lot of different things, FGM, other things. Mm -hmm. And they, they talk to, especially because we have a, a very high rate of infant and maternal mortality rate, they talk about um, preparals and they teach them about um, identification and referral of you know, complications. They teach all this, whether it's the infant or the mother, and they, they, the community midwives who are working in these rural areas, we call them, or if they come in court, we recall them, we register them, not only register them, but we give them training, and I, I forget to tell you guys, but we are the link between nurses and wives and other people who are working in Somalia. We are that bridge. We connect them to different things. And the international community or the other organizations, whether they are local NGOs or international, they contact us so that they can get an access mm -hmm. to these things. So if they are doing a program somewhere, they will contact us. And we will, we will help them go and reach the community <coughs> So there are a lot of things going on, but um, there are still there very remote areas who, don't, who are not close to health centers, who are not close to referral hospitals. There are areas where there are women dying, children dying, there are problems. But you cannot, you know, and, and you cannot conquer the world in, in a short time, but if it's, we are thinking about it. Are, are you actually collating that data? Because I think this is one of the most important things for Somaliland across the board with all ministries, <coughs> is collating the data um, on issues such as, for instance, HIV and AIDS. Yeah, there is a commission which um, is consists of all the ministries and all the organizations called the HIV AIDS Commission and people, uh, there are a lot of people working in that commission and trying to coordinate and collect the information, yes. Whether it's training, whether it's uh, treatment, whether it's uh, prevention and management, whatever. 
think we've got time for a couple more. Uh, Oh, sorry, Gillian. I guess, you, uh, because I'm sorry, I, I sidestepped her before. Just a quick comment related to the debate about infrastructure and skills. Um, and I feel quite strongly, and I'm, I'm sure Fuzzy would agree with me here, that if the nurses, midwives, and doctors are educated appropriately for the Somaliland context, they will be able to make the best of whatever the facilities are. <coughs> Not an excuse for having poor facilities. Sure. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't have to have high-tech equipment, running water, etc. There is a way around it, and if the nurses, midwives, doctors are properly educated with a passion to care for their people, that they will find a way to give the best possible care in whatever the circumstances are. And that's what I would hope um, is coming out of all the new developments around... Um, and if anyone wants, if anyone wants to pick up our perfume, I will put it here. If I could just echo that point quick, quickly and say, um, on a recent trip, um, I took my son, the pediatrician, uh, to mm. Hargeisa Hospital, and he made the point that you've made um, very strongly that yes. The, there were many aspects of the physical infrastructure that, that quite clearly need to be improved. But simple basic procedural changes, having simple manuals that, that people could adopt for pediatric care would improve the level of care by administration by, by again as well. Yeah. Enormous means. So it's it's not about machines and bricks and mortar. It's people mm. small toys for children. You know, there were no toys. They were on the thought to introduce toys for children, which assists in the recovery and this sort of thing until all these things. One other thing I would like to add to your question and answer is there are um, a cover called community health workers which are in the air, um, remote area. In the, we don't call those places, we don't call them health centers, we call them health posts, but it's started by community health workers. There are also community midwives who are now placed in the different villages and rural parts, and they are the ones who are helping mothers reach to the care of hospitals. But I'm not saying you know every area is covered. It's still very shortage, but that exists. Hi, I'm Tanya from the Mara Foundation. Just along the same line, I was wondering that there's obviously the aspect of getting people from those remote areas in for training. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the aspect of getting people who are trained to go out to those areas. And I understand when it's community workers, they're often picked from those communities, so there's already a, an incentive to go back there. Otherwise, does the association help incentivize them to go go out to areas, whether that's through sort of um, career development or you know, are there things like that in place to encourage people to go out further to areas that other people wouldn't go to? Or? No, we, you know, um, at the association, most of the, most of our members work for the government. About 70% of our members work for the government. Maybe the other 30% work for international NGOs and other local NGOs or other private places. So it's the government who employs them and tells them where well, to go in the country. It's not our, us who does. Okay. Yes, Saeed. My name is Saeed, yeah, thank you very much. I'm uh, from Home Cable Television. And I've been as well in Hargeisa uh, in 2005. And basically from a background of science, I've been teaching University of Hargeisa for a year and a half, biochemistry and clinical microbiology. The problem is, uh, according to Fossi, as she said as well, the basic is lack of equipment as well. So when you're teaching the medical students about science and cells and all the pathology and things like that, there will be no way that you can show them and then they can they have to imagine, close their eyes and they say, that's what the cells yeah. are all about. <laughs> things like that happen. So really she's this is what what she's doing is amazing job. Nursing and all the health sector is very poor. So from home cable TV as a director we give you a slot of an airtime <laughs> and what you want from us is that help. So we will give you a time as well. So <laughs> And please visit us tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saeed. Uh, Mohammed Liban from Ali Entrepreneur Limited. Just to say I'm delighted to be here today. 
a uh, quick thanks to Mark for letting me show me on, on this event and the invitation. For see what you're doing is pretty amazing. Congratulations to yourself, the association and your team. Um, I'm actually quite excited to say I'm going to the Gresa um, next week, so quite excited about that. If there's anything as a company that we can do, I'm a big fan of uh, philanthropy, charity and support in such organisations. I wasn't actually even aware that there were any societies as such, so it's a good thing that uh, Zayda's just offered a bit of promotion, publicity, and it's important to actually get it out there to the mainstream. So I just felt it was as, as if it was just the elite, you know, like in the suit, dressed up, to be aware of such organisations. So it's good to actually put it out to, you know, mainstream people so congratulations again thank you and thanks for the offer and yeah anyone who these are you know produced sure. for free and I please take yeah, yeah. Uh, you know as many as you want to help establish what's been going on I would like on. to say one thing and I would like to say one thing before you go uh, it's not only me doing this it's a team effort I have a dedicated staff at the SLMA I have a wonderful board who support me and work with me. I have my international partners and who work with me, who are really wonderful support wherever they are. So this is an, a teamwork, not Very only much. me. So I can't take all the credit. <laughs> and the last question. I hope it's a short one. Last one, because people I know. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Alison Radikate, I'm a director of um, Reception and Productivals. Thank you. The Liverpool School of Public Medicine. Thank you. Part of the consortium for the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists International to control their mission. Um, we are been, um, supporting in the health system training program. I uh, just wanted to add to what Fulvia said about the issue of uh, ensuring that health workers are deployed. Um, to remote area, you know, the, the question that you raised. That as part of the community health workers training, especially for the community midwives, girls were actually selected from their communities. Yeah. So they were trained and they were born to go back to the communities to work. So, I, and I think that's a very good system, yeah, that as they were trained, they were eliminated by the community, they were trained for the communities. So there wasn't any problem in terms of asking them to go back to or work in that community. But that also leads me to another question because I know that that um, training was supposed to be a pilot study you know, for community midwives and it was funded by UNFP. I'm not sure if that is continuing or if that has stopped due to funding. Thank you very much. And if anyone missed the introduction, the you know, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine are also involved in, in the partnership with, with, with Somaliland. Thank you very much for your, your contribution. And, I'm sorry. You have to have yes, please. And yes, if the first group was in a pilot program. There are two groups that graduated from Adna Community was who were um, selected from different communities, trained and then brought back. And we as association, we honored them, we gave them uh, basic methods of statistical care, we gave them life saving skills training. And we also, with the support of uh, UNFPA, we gave them the delivery kits, and then they went back to the communities. There is also 100 that's going to be, to, that, will, that will graduate with next year. 20 is going to be trained in our region. 20 are going to be trained in Aldo. 20 are going to be trained in Hargeisa. So um, 20 will be trained in Seoul. So 800. More, another hundred more community midwives are going to be trained. And who's funding that? Hmm? Who's funding that? UN, UNFPA. 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 Okay. Well, I think at that note, uh, so you do, you know, do, do feel free to, to speak. Just the proposal, um, I just had a look at who's actually yeah. funding that. They have actually started uh, sort of working towards this proposal, this project. This proposal that you've given. The proposal. Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm going to have to. Uh, sorry, um, I would just like to um, thank you all again for for coming and for your contributions. There were a lot of very good points raised, and most of all, um, I'd like to uh, thank Fazia and Mohammed again. Thank you. Sorry, please, you know, do. Sorry, I could. I knew everyone was going behind you. <laughs>